Welcome back, everyone. This is Brett Wimsat, the decontamination program manager. And at this time, we're now going to begin the aquatic invasive species watercraft inspection presentation. A lot of us may have heard of clean, drain, dry, but we don't exactly. I'm now going to help you use your head in performing a watercraft inspection. So what does head stand for? H stands for the hull and trailer. E stands for the engine. A stands for anchors, lines, and equipment. And D stands for drain. These four combined make up the primary ways that aquatic invasive species will be hitchhiking on a watercraft and being introduced into a new water body. H, this is the hull. So when we're inspecting the hull and trailers, the external parts of the boat, we're going to be doing a tactile and visual inspection. You want to be visually inspecting for any uh, mud or aquatic vegetation that's anywhere on the trailer or external part of the hull as well as you want to feel. Things like small juvenile colonies of zebra mussels can start to grow on the outside of a boat, particularly around um, the transom of the boat near the motor in the bilge area the, where the bilge plug comes out. Sometimes these aren't, areas aren't easily seen, so you need to visually, uh, physically feel the side of the boat for small bumps and adhesions. In order to make sure that you're checking the entire boat, it's good to work your way around the boat in a predetermined pattern. So pick one starting point, start from high or start from low, and make sure when you work your way around the boat, you're checking high and low at all points as you work your way around to your initial starting point. Things to be looking for at that time is for complete or fragmented vegetation, roots or seeds, adult mollusks, sandpaper-like abrasions, which would be those immature mollusk populations I had mentioned, as well as damp equipment or standing water. Nine times out of ten, aquatic invasive species hitchhiking on a watercraft aren't going to be visible from a standing position or from afar. So it's very important that you get up close and personal with these watercrafts and make sure to get down and look underneath them. A lot of times these aquatic invasives are going to be trapped on the bottom of the boat, on the lower parts of the trailer, and they're going to be difficult to find, so you need to get down underneath and take a good look. Now that you've already completed the watercraft anatomy section, this diagram is probably pretty familiar to you. It's the same one used. So this is where AIS commonly hides on watercrafts. And if you notice, Every single one of those ID points are highlighted in red. At the end of the day, it's important to note that no place should be considered a safe place that AIS didn't collect. Don't just, you can't not look inside the boat in certain places or on the outside because it's an unlikely place for AIS. You'd be surprised where they could show up. AIS has no problem popping up on someone's windshield or on the seat cushion. It doesn't just have to be wrapped around the propeller in the standard places that you'd expect to find it. However, there are more common places where you will find it. These are gonna be your internal compartments wherever water comes in contact with. So this could be the anchor locker when you bring in the anchor from the bottom of the lake so it might have mud or aquatic vegetation on it. Live wells and bilge areas these are both areas where water from outside end up inside the boat. Next is the outboard engine. The two most common places you're going to find aquatic invasives here will be on the lower unit and the propeller. The lower unit sticks below the water surface. It's a good place to hook onto vegetation as well as there's a water intake vent. That intake vent has the ability to suck in water and bring it into the engine to cool it, which is also then um, a source where zebra mussel villagers, fragmentation of, of plants, or spiny water fleas could get sucked in. Also the propeller. The propeller is a moving part below the surface um, and it it's very easy to hook aquatic vegetation onto this. Next would be the through hull. This is also a place where water from the lake is traveling in and out of the boat, making it a great place for things like zebra mussel villagers to um, start a localized colony. Also places to check would be the gunnel and the cleat. 
They are on high traffic areas of the watercraft. So if you're bringing fishing gear in or out of your vessel, it's a high probability that something could get caught in these locations. And then the hull and keel. So these are both areas just where they are going to be in contact with the water all day. Um, and so these are the places where zebra mussel colonies can start to occur, as well as just small pieces of fragmentation of, of uh, vegetation when you're coming out of the launch. So again, you're probably pretty familiar with this image by now as well, where it was also used in the watercraft anatomy presentation. So once again, you're going to notice all of these locations are also marked in red. When it comes down to it, any place is a high probability place for AIS. Important places to look though are anywhere that has something um, that AIS could get caught on. And the transom is a very good place for this to occur. There's the tie down straps for the trailer. There's the bilge pump port. There's the lower unit, the propeller and electronics. The electronics for the transducer are a fantastic place for vegetation to get caught on. It hangs slightly lower than the bottom of the boat, making it a great place for if you're going over vegetation near the launch, for vegetation to get hooked on it, as well as um, for juvenile mollusks, mollusks to get caught there and start to establish populations if the watercraft's been in the water for an extended period of time. No surprise here, you're gonna see everything labeled in red again. So therefore, you should never just expect that somewhere doesn't have AIS. Just always give everything a full and thorough inspection. You never know where AIS is going to pop up. However, like I said before, there's certainly places that are going to be more common than others. So the common places, the most common places you're going to find AIS on a trailer are the places that are going to come in most contact with the water. The front portion of the trailer where it connects to the boat are the least likely just because they are not um, being submerged into the water as often. So starting from the rear of the trailer where the trailer lights are, the trailer lights where the license plate hangs off of the frame are very good places for AIS to collect. They have a lot of edges and corners and if there's any vegetation near the launch, it's a, it's, that's the, the part of the trailer that goes the furthest and the deepest into the water. Next is whatever type of roller guides or bunk system there is for that trailer at a given time. So how this AIS will commonly get caught here is the watercraft when it comes in contact with the trailer to be removed from the water, AIS can commonly be caught in between the roller guides or the bunks and the trailer. Thus they can be caught and pretty inaccessible for removing. The next places is any of the brackets and hardware that's associated with those rollers or bunks that connect to the frame of the trailer or the axles. Anywhere that there's a sharp point or an appendage of some sort, it's just a great place for aquatic vegetation to hook onto. So the next place are the tires, the wheels, and the fenders. Same thing, these are submerged areas uh, with moving parts and they have a high probability of hooking onto invasives. Make sure to not just look at the front faces of areas like the tires and the fenders. They're just as likely to be attached to the backside. So make sure you take a look underneath the trailer. Look at the axle. Look out the underside of the bunks. Look on the backside of the tires and wheels. E for engines. So when you're inspecting engines, there's two primary ways that they're going to have aquatic invasive species hitchhiking on them. The first one is the exter exterior part of the drive system. So this would be the lower unit and the propeller. Um, aquatic invasive uh, vegetation will commonly get tangled on the propeller due to the fact that it's a rotary spinning part. The second way that they could transport is through standing water in the internal cooling system. So how outboard engines work is they suck water in through an intake vent on the lower unit and that brings it through a vascular system in the motor to keep the motor cool. So therefore, small, small bodied aquatic invasive animals such as zebra mussels or spiny water fleas could get sucked into that intake water. So when you're turning off your engine, there could be still viable aquatic invasive species inside there. 
though at that point you wouldn't be able to determine if there was an invasive species in there. If there was, if, the, if there's found to be standing water in the motor, then you need to consider it as a high risk location. So therefore, in order to check to see if there's water still in the motor, have, have the boater trim down the motor all the way to see if any water runs out. If water runs out, then that means that there's a high probability that um, there could be some sort of sediment or AIS still located up inside the cooling system. At that point, it'd be highly recommended to perform a lower unit flush on that watercraft. So the external places to check on an engine are going to be the propeller, the intake vent, the intake vent has a screen over it, so large particulates can't get in, but sometimes larger fragments can get caught on the outside of it. The transducer mounting hardware and the hoses and wires. So AIS can be found on motors both above and below the water line, so don't just check the propeller. A lot of people, especially the boaters, um, when they're taking a look at their boat themselves, they're only looking at the propeller. But like I've mentioned before, AIS can be found anywhere. The motor could kick up water and a piece of Eurasian water milfoil could be on, on the top of the hood. It could be found anywhere, so don't just look in the high probability places, look everywhere. Here we're going to see um, two different images of inboard outboard and outboard engine and how water is introduced into their systems to be able to properly cool their engine. So on the right hand image that's an outboard motor and it's just showing on the bottom portion next to the propeller where water is brought into the engine and brought up to the power head to be able to cool its engine and then dispensing that water out of them. So just that's to give you an idea of where water travels and how it is able to bring in AIS from in the water body itself and bring it in to the motor. After the boat motor is turned off and the boat is still in the water, the engine is commonly then trimmed up to its highest position so that it can be put on the trailer and, and uh, driven away. In doing this, whatever water was still in the engine is now trapped inside due to the angle of the motor. It doesn't allow the water to drain out. In doing this, this now allows water to remain inside the engine for transport. So in those final minutes of the boat idling near the dock, if it had sucked in any zebra mussel villagers that had gone trapped in the intake vent or anywhere in that system, they are now sitting in water and going to remain viable until they are launched into the next water body. To ensure that this water isn't trapped in the motor in the upright position, when a boat is leaving the launch, ask the boater to trim the motor all the way down to make sure that all water has drained out of the outboard. Inspection of anchors, lines, and equipment. So basically what this is looking for is checking all of your equipment that had come in contact with the water that day or just in the past in general. This could be your anchor chain and the associated lines with it. This could be your dock lines. It could be equipment such as, as fishing gear, your life jackets, a bait bucket, um, any swimming or sporting equipment such as wakeboards and water skis. D, this stands for drained. So you want to make sure that you have drained all standing water in all compartments within your watercraft. So standing water represents the potential to transport basically all AIS. This could be aquatic vegetation or small bodied aquatic invasive animals such as spiny water flea or zebra mussel. To give you a further understanding of the significance of standing water, spiny water fleas can't be transported to another water body if there isn't water available in the watercraft. If they are left out to dry, they're going to die before they can be transported anywhere else. So even if there's just a cup of water in the bilge or somewhere in a compartment in the boat, spiny water flea have the ability to stay alive and be transported to a new water body. As for zebra mussels, the young juvenile forms, the villagers, can survive for up to 30 days in a single drop of water. Thus, due to the fact that we can't always see small-bodied AIA in these um, standing water locations, if there's ever 
a situation where a boat comes in with standing water, especially in live wells or anchor wells or in the bilge, it's always a good recommendation for them to perform a decontamination. Now, other common boating equipment that needs to be inspected. So these are going to be areas that include transducers, which are fish or depth finders and GPS style units. Speed sensors, which are commonly accompanied with um, sonar type systems. These are sometimes a small wheel system off the transom of the boat that allows the boat to figure out how fast it's going. Um, trim tabs, these are pictured in the bottom right image. They are a hydraulic trim plate that goes up and down that allows larger watercrafts to be able to achieve the proper um, planing they are looking for. Paddles and oars, as well as life jackets, type 5 throwable flotation devices, and then, as mentioned before, all tubes, water skis, and associated ropes for recreational style sports. Shallow water anchors are another very important. The next important place to inspect is all fishing equipment. By nature, fishing equipment ends up in the water, whether it's the lure, the fishing line, um, or even the bait bucket that's filled up with water. It's a, they're all great places for aquatic invasive species and aquatic invasive animals to collect. A popular form of fishing is by trolling with downriggers. Downriggers are a mechanism that connect to the back of the boat that lower a heavy concrete or steel ball, commonly eight pounds or more, to the lower part of the water column. Your fishing line is then connected to a snap near the bottom of this ball, which allows you to drop your lure down to the area where you want to fish, whether it's, it's 50 feet below your boat or 80 feet below your boat. It allows you to troll in deeper water. So this is important to us for the fact of spiny water fleas. Spiny water fleas during the day commonly inhibit the lower portion of the water column. So if you're trolling with downriggers, which are allowing your fishing lines to get down to the deepest portion of the lake, it's allowing, it's giving a great opportunity for spiny water flea to collect on your line. So this right hand picture gives you an idea of what spiny water fleas look like on fishing line. If a watercraft shows up or going into the water or out, make sure to check for those locations such as the downriggers and fishing poles. Make sure that there isn't any aquatic vegetation, but also look for spiny water fleas that could be affixed to the line as well as they commonly get caught near any metal connection in your line, such as a swivel snap or a barrel swivel. The next place to check is trolling motors. Trolling motors can be found on two places of the boats. First one is they could be on the transom, the rear part of the boat, and used to steer from the back. The other more common place you're going to find them is on fishing vessels on the front bow of the boat used as a foot-controlled trolling motor. Trolling motors are important to check because once again they are used below the water line and they have moving parts. These are great places for aquatic vegetation to be hooked on. So these next couple slides are going to be repeats from watercraft anatomy. Similar to the breakdown of the, the parts of the boat, these are very important places where AIS can collect and they're going to be places that you need to know how to inspect for AIS. So this first one is the bilge. So now that we know that the bilge is the lowest point in the watercraft where wa excess water collects, how does that have to do with finding AIS? Well, for starters, the fact that it holds water gives it the ability to transport AIS very well and for long periods of time. Additionally, where this is the lowest focal point of the boat, any AIS that had made it inside the boat will be drained or, or will fall down into this lowest central location. Commonly, the bilge area of the boat can be very difficult to view. A lot, uh, due to the fact that there's floorboards and a whole structure above it. So the best way to determine if the bilge is clean is to first make sure it's dry. So make sure the bilge plug is removed. These are pictured in the left and for this right image. If the bilge plug is removed, there should be no water coming out of the bilge. If there is water coming out, then that does present 
the risk of having viable fragmentation or small body to aquatic evasive animals in there. If there is standing water in the vessel, particularly the bilge, make sure to recommend a watercraft decontamination at this time. Live wells and bait wells. So again, these containers, internal compartments, have water in them. So therefore, any standing water presents the risk of having viable fragmentation or small-bodied AIA located in them. This risk is heightened by the fact of how these compartments are filled with water. They have internal electrical pumps that pump water through through hulls in the boat from the lake, pond, or river that the watercraft is in. So therefore, if there is any nearby invasive species such as zebra mussel villagers, spiny water flea, or even a fragment of milfoil, those could get sucked into the live well from those pumps. If the boater isn't careful and properly drain and dry these internal compartments, those aquatic invasive species could remain viable until that water is removed. In a similar fashion, these ballast tanks and bags also have electronic pumps that bring water through through hulls on the bottom of the boat to fill these compartments. Thus, if there's any nearby aquatic invasive species, they can be easily sucked into the boat and stored until that water is expelled. Now, if that water isn't pumped out of there until in a different water body, that is now cross-contamination and you could be introducing new in aquatic invasive species into a different water body. So now what constitutes a past inspection? So a watercraft that passes inspection means that it conformed to the clean, drain, dry standard. It was clean, it didn't have any vegetation, fragmentation, muddy soil, anything like that inside the watercraft. It was drained. That means that there was no standing water um, or visible water anywhere in the internal compartments or the motor. And it was dry. It means that there was no damp equipment um, or wet areas found in the boat anywhere that could be um, holding aquatic invasive species. So when a watercraft passes inspection, you do not need to recommend them for decontamination, whether you are at a decontamination site or not. However, you can always still let them, the boater know that a decontamination is always a resource open to them at any time, whether they passed inspection or not. Failed inspection. So this means the watercraft didn't meet the clean, drain, dry standard. So for clean, that means that the watercraft probably had some form of aquatic vegetation found somewhere on the vessel, or maybe it had zebra mussels found in the bilge. Drain. This would mean that there was standing water somewhere in the watercraft. It could be in the bilge, it could be in the live well, or maybe the ballast tanks hadn't been drained yet. Dry. This means since the watercraft was last in the water, the watercraft had not dried all of its equipment. This could be fishing equipment, skiing equipment, it could be the life jackets and seat cushions. Upon a failed inspection, the steward or decontamination technician should recommend the boat for decontamination at that time.